is up guys so this is going to be an exciting series so welcome again to mythic mondays and this is probably going to be a multi-part uh story and we are going to talk about heracles when you say myth you think the iliad you think the odyssey and you think heracles which is more popularly popularly known as his roman counterpart hercules and so we're going to just read about the young Heracles today. And then possibly next week, if you guys want to, we can talk about the labors of Heracles. So we're going to talk about his youth in today's episode. And then move on from there. At the time of his birth, Alchemy was leaving in Theva. Theva is what we would call Thebes. Uh, with her husband, Amphitron. And thus the infant Heracles was born in the palace of his stepfather. And aware of the animosity with which Era persecuted all those ri who rivaled her in the affections of Zeus, Alcamene, fearful lest his hatred should, her hatred should be shown, visited upon her innocent child and trusted him soon after his birth to the care of a faithful servant with instructions to expose him in a certain field and there leave him feeling assured that the divine offspring of Zeus would not long remain without the protection of the gods. Soon after the child had thus been abandoned, Era and Pallas Athena happened to pass by the field and were attracted by its cries. Athena pityingly took up the infant in her arms and prevailed upon the queen of heaven to put it upon her breast. But, sooner, but no sooner had she done so that the child causing her pain she grew angry and threw him to the ground and left the spot. Athena, moved with compassion, carried the child to Alchemene and entreated her kind office on the behalf of the poor little foundling. Alchemene at once recognized her child and joyfully accepted the charge. Soon afterwards, Era, to her extreme annoyance, discovered whom she had nursed that day and became filled with jealous rage. She now sent two venomous snakes into the chamber of Alchemene, which crept unperceived by the nurses to the cradle of the sleeping child. He awoke with a cry, and grasping a snake in each hand, strangled them both. Alchemene and her attendants, whom the cry of the child had awakened, rushed to the cradle, where to the astonishment and terror, they beheld the two reptiles dead in the hands of the infant Heracles. Amphitron was also attracted to the chamber by the commotion. And when he beheld this astounding proof of supernatural strength, he declared that the child must have been sent to him as a special guest from Zeus. He accordingly consulted the famous seer Tiresias, who now informed him of the divine origins of his stepson. For he, a great and distinguished feat, for him, Heracles, baby Heracles, was going to have a great and distinguished future. At a suitable age, he himself taught him how to hand, how to guide the chariot, Eurytus how to handle the bow, Autolycus dexterity in wrestling and boxing, and Castor the art of armed warfare. Whilst Linus, the son of Apollo, instructed him in music and letters. Heracles was an apt pupil. But undue harshness was intolerable to his high spirit, and old Linus, who was not the gentlest of teachers, one day corrected him with his blows, whereupon the boy angrily took out his lyre, and with one stroke of his powerful arm, killed his tutor on the spot. Apprehensive lest the ungovernable temper of the youth might again involve him in similar, similar acts of violence, Heracles' father sent him to the country, where he placed him under the charge of one of the most trusted herdsmen. Here, as he grew to manhood, his extraordinary stature and strength became the wonder and admiration of all beholders. His aim, whether with a spear, or lance, or bow, was unerring, and at the age of 18 he was considered to be the strongest as well as the most beautiful youth in all of Greece. Heracles felt that the time had now arrived when it became necessary to decide for himself how to use an extraordinary power with which he had been endowed by the gods, and in order to meditate in solitude on this important subject, he repaired to a lonely and secluded spot in the heart of the forest. Here two females of great beauty appeared to him. One was vice, the other was virtue. 
The former was a full was full of art, artificial wiles and fascinating arts. Her face painted and her dress gaudy and attractive, whilst the latter was a noble bearing and modest mien, her robes of spotless purity. Vice stepped forward and thus addressed him. If you will walk in my path and make me your friend, your life shall be one round of pleasure and enjoyment. You shall taste every delight which can be procured on earth. The most delicious wines, the most luxury, luxurious of couches shall ever be at your disposal, and all without the excursion of your part, either physical or mental. Virtue now spoke in her turn. If you follow me and be my friend, I promise you that the reward, I reward a good conscience in the love and respect of your fellow men. I cannot undertake to smooth your pain with roses or to give you a life of idleness and pleasure, for you know that the gods grant no good and desirable thing that is not earned by labor. And as you, a son, you must sow what you reap. And Ericles listened patiently and attentively to both speakers. And then after a mature deliberation, decided to follow the path of virtue and henceforth to honor the gods and to devote his life to the service of his country. And full of these noble resolves, he sought once more his rural home, where he was informed that on the mount at the foot of which the herds of Amphitron were grazing, a ferocious lion had fixed his lair and was committing such frightful ravages among the flocks and the herds that he had become the scourge and terror of the whole of the whole neighborhood. Ericles at once armed himself and ascended the mountain where he caught sight of the lion, rushing at him with the sword succeeding in the killing him. The height of the animal he wore ever after over his shoulders and the head severed as his helmet. As he was returning from his from this, his ex first exploit, he met the er the herald of kings of the Manians who were proceeding to Theba to demand their annual tribute of a hundred oxen. Indignant at this humiliation of his native city, Ericles mutilated the heralds and sent them back with ropes around their necks to the royal master. The Regenus was so incensed at the ill treatment of his messengers that he collected an army and appeared before the gates of Theba, demanding the surrender of Ericles. Creon, who was at the time the king of Ithiba, feared the consequences of a refusal and was about to yield when the hero, with the assistance of Amphitron and a band of brave youths, advanced against the minions. Ericles took possession of a narrow defile through which the enemies were compelled to pass and they entered the pass that the Thebans fell upon, killed their king, and completely round, routed them. In this engagement, Amphitron, the kind friend and foster father of Ericles, lost his life. The hero now advanced to the capital of the minions, where he burned the royal castle and sacked the town. And after the signal of victory, all, great, all of Greece rang the fame of the young hero, and Creon, and in gratitude for his services, bestowed upon him the daughter, his daughter, Megara, in marriage. The Olympian gods testified their appreciation of his valor by sending him presents. Hermes gave him a sword, Apollo a bundle of arrows, and Hephaestus a golden quiver, and Athena a coat of leather. So that was the beginning of the adventures of Ericles. And possibly we may move on to the labors of Ericles in our next week's episode. Anyway, guys, hope you guys enjoyed it. I'll see you later. Bye.